Manhunter games are really a fascinating, creepy experience. The surreal atmosphere really hooked me, especially considering how it was made using only 16 colors. It's amazing to think that the siblings Dee Dee, Dave and Barry Murray created this dystopian world with such limited technologies. Dee Dee's haunting, pixelated landscapes and post-apocalyptic cityscapes set the perfect tone for a Halloween game night, don't you think? She became an award-winning wildlife artist, which makes sense considering the artistic skills she brought into the pixelated world of the games. The eerie, desolate environment she crafted with her brother Barry feel both minimalistic and surreal, and the lack of dialogue makes the visual storytelling even more powerful in my opinion. In an interview, her brothers Dave and Barry said they were heavily inspired by alternative comics and dystopian films like Blade Runner, which I think is quite apparent in the game's oppressive Orwellian tone. I particularly loved how the unsettling silence and bizarre alien designs added a layer of tension to the whole game. In Manhunter New York, the first game, players assume the role of a human forced to work for the alien overlords known as the Orbs, who have taken over the city. As a Manhunter, you secretly investigate human resistance movements while uncovering a grisly murder mystery. In the sequel Manhunter 2 San Francisco, the story continues as you pursue a renegade across the city, unraveling a darker conspiracy behind the Orbs control. The gameplay is also rather unique, as you are not using a text parser that was usually used in the games from that time, but it's more like a point and click interface. Unfortunately, not controlled with a mouse, but the keyboard or the joystick, but I think it works well enough after you get used to it. The game is also played from a first person perspective, so you don't have a character moving around directly, but you have these beautiful full screen views of all the locations and many very impressive detail shots throughout the whole game. Besides your typical puzzle solving, you also have a lot of arcade action minigames, which I'm not such a big fan of. Even though you have difficulty setting, at least in the second game, these are still quite hard and can become annoying quickly. But I guess that's also down to personal preference. When I'm playing a point and click adventure, I don't need those, but if you're more into action games, then this might be your cup of tea. You can and will die a lot in these games, but it's very appreciated that you will get set back right to before you died and you can just continue playing and don't have to worry about saving or loading the game. I did not encounter any dead ends in the game, but take that with a grain of salt as I did not have the time to finish both games, so there might still be some in the later parts. What I did find quite cool was this device you have where you can track the movement and actions of a person in this abstract digital way so you can try to follow up what they did and try to find out what really happened. It's a great and intuitive tool to visualize what you actually have to do in the game. The sound and music unfortunately is only PC speaker and I think Tandy sound device but that doesn't seem to sound any better so that's a bit of a bummer but well what can you expect from a DOS game from 1988. So would I recommend playing these games today? Well, maybe not playing, but definitely check them out. They are a one-of-a-kind experience blending horror, mystery and dark humor in a way that was way ahead of its time. I hope you enjoyed this little special series over the last few days and with that I think there's not much more for me to say than Happy Halloween and see ya!